Hi, everyone. Thanks for this episode of Nick Egan Times. On this episode, we have a fantastic guest. We have the legendary John Onjazik of Fire for Fighting. John of Five for Fighting is an incredibly talented US pianist, singer, songwriter, producer, and speaker. John of Five for Fighting has had multiple massive worldwide smash hits, including Superman, 100 Years, and The Riddle. John of Five for Fighting is music, sorry, is in over 300 movies, television shows, and commercial. Five for Fighting is about to kick off a national US spring tour starting on March the 26th. Welcome, John. Thanks for coming on the podcast, and I do appreciate it. Thank you, Nick. Nice to be with you. Welcome. All right, let's jump straight into it. Tell me about, firstly, the Music Matters Challenge. Um, that's incredible. I was reading up on it, and it's a really fantastic initiative that you're doing. Well, thank you. I appreciate you uh, talking about that. We actually just launched the video today. Um, when I was um, in elementary school in Los Angeles, uh, music funding was cut to the elementary schools, and we lost our music teacher. And my mom who was a piano teacher, volunteered uh, and started putting on full musicals at our elementary school. I was actually Tony in West Side Story, probably because my mom was producing it. But um, and 50 years later, those kids um, still talk to my mom and, and it changed lives. And having music in schools is so critical on so many levels. You can do the research, but, you know, mental wellness, graduation rates, um, um, uh, grades. Uh, and and so uh, I partnered with a, an amazing Chicago foundation, the Tolman Foundation, and we're launching uh, basically a national competition, something kind of like the Ice Bucket Challenge, where everybody can put up a video, talk about a music teacher that mattered to them, sing the song Let Music Fill My World that I wrote with some Chicago inner city kids that lost their music teacher. Um, for that school, we actually provided a music teacher for them for three years. And this contest will run, you know, through Music in the Schools month and, and through April. And the winners will uh, help us put another full-time music teacher in a school of need, win some money. There'll be a school prize. But really what we're doing is we're raising awareness how critical music is for every kid. Four million kids in America don't have music in their schools. And it should be a lot of fun, a lot of singing, a lot of joy. And uh, I can't wait for it to get going. That's sensational. It's a great opportunity too for disadvantaged kids or any type of kid for that matter, obviously to have a chance. And yeah, music's obviously such a big part of life. It's really resonates with everyone and makes everyone happy. So. No, you're right. You know, it's, 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 it's the thing that brings us together. It's the, it's an escape. It's the way to uh, share your voice. I mean, maybe you're, you, you're not very good at, maybe you're a little shy. You're not very good talking, but you know, you sing or you paint or you dance and uh, all the infos at letmusicfillmyworld.com. And uh, I look forward to your entry, Nick. Come on, buddy. I know, yeah. I know you have a story. Everybody has a story. <laughs> <laughs> i got plenty of stories, but nothing like yours, mate. You'll make me look bad if we did that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, let's go into, you created a new single. I was, I was actually looking at it yesterday. Um, okay. It's amazing. Yeah. It's really, obviously, uh, a deep and confronting as well, especially the video. Um, talk to me about that and, um, yeah, I guess the background of what drew you to do it and just, yeah, everything relating to it. You know, um, I think we, you know, we were all horrified by the images of October 7th. I mean, it reminded us of 9-11. Frankly, it reminded us of the Afghan withdrawal. Just, you know, images you could never, you know, imagine seeing. But I think what was maybe shocking to so many of us was the aftermath. You know, within 24 hours, you had thousands of people celebrating in Times Square, and you quickly saw our colleges becoming these rampant anti-Semitic, you know, hell holes, and people ripping down posters of hostages, and people, you know, Rashida Tlaib, you know, basically being a Hamas kind of propagandist, and that really scared me and depressed me. And so the video really talked about kind of the collapse of the media, the this our, our academia, um, our politics, and and how that's really um, a global phenomenon. It's not just Israel and Hamas. And the fact that so many of our kids um, have kind of been indoctrinated to this mindset where majority of, of, of our kids in many polls support, support Hamas over Israel. They call them occupiers. Uh, they don't believe the Holocaust happened. So we're really fighting for the generation, the soul of our kids. And so that's really, to me, what the video is about is, is pointing out that, hey, look, this is just not... Israel Hamas. This is really 
those fighting for civilization against those who want to tear it down. And, you know, when Israel shared the video on, on their social media, you know, the whole thing went to another level. And, and I, I'm not a Jewish person, but I, I feel like I understand how it is to be a Jewish person now, kind of seeing the vitriol that, that came my way. But it's, uh, I think it's important for everyone to stand up. And tragically, Nick, I got to tell you, the music business has been deathly silent and it's incredibly shameful. Yeah, it's um, remarkable how it has been quiet and just everything's just transpired since obviously the tragic events happened. Yeah, yeah. I think it to that song, um, watching it, it was very, very well put together and it's an incredible song and, you know, well done for doing it. It's amazing. Thank you. All right. Um, tell me about your tour that's coming up. Um, it's just kicking off very shortly. Talk to me about that. That's, that's really exciting. Yeah, you know, it's... <laughs> The world, you know, seems like a dark place. And whenever I go out and sing with my pals, my musician friends, my soul is lifted and hopefully the audience too. But yeah, we're heading out um, next week. I'm actually heading off to New York to do a keynote. And then our tour starts in Fargo, North Dakota, uh, which I've never been to. And I'm I'm going out this round with uh, the string quartet, amazing string quartet. They're all Broadway players. My, my violin player just won a Tony Award. I just I just am in awe of them every night. And it gives a different dimension to Superman, 100 Years, Chances. And we can play songs that are not in my rock band set list. And it's a very intimate family show. You know, we recognize our troops. So, yeah, we're going out for, you know, for um, two weeks. Then I'm actually going to go to Israel for a week. And then I'm going to come back and finish the tour. So, you know, uh, talk to me in five weeks. I probably won't have much of a voice, but I'll have a lot of stories to tell. <laughs> yeah, very, very busy man, my friend. Very, very busy man. Um, all right, take us back. Initially, um, growing up, and obviously, I guess to when you started getting your first big break. I guess when you got the real traction. What was that like for you growing up, and how was your family? Yeah, I had a you know a really blessed childhood. You know, my my parents are amazing. Uh, as mentioned, my mom was a piano teacher. My dad was an astrophysicist, um, worked at NASA. So I kind of had, you know, the engineer's genes and the musician's genes. And uh, when my grandfather passed away, my dad took over his business, which was a manufacturing business, uh, wire manufacturing. So I started working too as a young, a young, you know, teen kind of in manufacturing and you know, sweating on the line and, you know, working 10 hours and learning how to run a business. And so I had a lot of interesting experiences, but I always loved music. I always loved the piano. My mom started me very young. And when I was 13, she was very wise. I wanted to quit and, you know, ride my skateboard and chase girls. And she let me quit. And then I didn't have to practice. So I started writing songs and I loved writing songs and I loved the great songwriters and I loved the great singers, you know, Freddie Mercury, you know, Steve Perry, go down the list. Um, and, um, and, uh, you know, I'm one of those 15 year overnight success stories. <laughs> I struggled, I struggled, you know, I had a couple record deals and record companies close, you know, closed and, but I finally kind of the stars aligned in it kind of a m miraculous way. Superman, um, became popular. And then certainly after nine 11, it took another kind of meaning for the country. And, um, and I've been able to kind of do it, do it for 20 years. And, and, uh, certainly I'm not. I'm not Elton, I'm not Billy, but I'm blessed to have uh, a career where I can kind of write and sing songs and people can sing them back to me. That's amazing. With um with Superman, um, I remember being young at the time, obviously, when 9-11 happened. And I actually remember vividly your song having highlights of 9-11, obviously the terrifying um, scenes of it. And it was really, really, um, how do I describe it, confronting, but it was such a accurate song, the lyrics and the way it, it was done together. It's something that I probably couldn't describe properly in words, but it was really, really ties into that. How did that make you feel um, with that song, obviously, you know, being a post 9-11 anthem, really? Yeah, it's surreal. I mean, you know, you never want to have your song, you know, you never want to see something like that happen. And um, you can never imagine your song being associated with such an evil act. But at the same time, you know, music can provide solace in a unique way. I was actually in London on 9-11 and it took me, you know, 10 days to get back. You know, people, you know, will remember of my age, you know, there were no planes, there was no flights. 
And I didn't really realize what was happening with Superman until I got back. And and then I saw on the news, you know, a lot of stations were doing that, you know, intercutting some of the heroes running into the buildings with Superman and particularly New York City embraced the song. And so for a kid, you know, you know or I have to say a young man who, who just gotten used to hearing his song on the radio, all of a sudden, you know, you're at the concert for New York with all the icons of the world playing that song. You know, any other day in your life, you'd be like, oh, my God, this is like a hundred dreams come true. But of course, it wasn't that that day. You're talking to the families and you're crying. And you're... so I'm glad the song was there when the country needed it. I saw firsthand how music can, you know, you know, transform people. And it's not about record sales and hits and fame and fortune. And it's not it wasn't my performance, but I remember when The Who came on and you know blew the roof off Madison Square Garden playing Bob O'Reilly. You know, you saw 20,000 people who many of them been down at ground zero for, you know, from day one, digging through rubble, finding bodies. You know, they were crying, they were singing, they were screaming, they were hugging each other. And I think for the first time they had a chance to, to release everything inside them. So that was an education to me. And it kind of led to me doing a lot of work with our troops and Gary Sinise and USO, you know, um, to kind of let let music be a, a, a tool of wellness for them. So I think that education kind of formed maybe my, you know, a lot of my career, but still to this day, you know, 23 years later, I, it's hard to wrap my head around what Superman became and, and the performance of concert for New York, but I'm glad it was there when people needed it. Yeah. Amazing. And it's a timeless hit too. Like, you know, I even, <laughs> I have those two songs that and a hundred years. Um, they're my two <laughs> up there and my favorite songs. So yeah. It's oh. incredible. Actually briefly, tell me about a hundred years too. What was the inspiration behind that, behind that song? Yeah. Well, you know, after Superman, it's kind of like, how do you follow that? You know, you know, one hit wonder. Um, and it was really hard. I, I spent two years trying to write a song that could like, not be Superman, but be like that guy. And, and I struggled. It took a long time. And I was sitting, you know, on the couch one day with my two little kids. I had two kids. And at the time they were like three and two. And, you know, I'm one of those guys that's always like dwelling on the past or future tripping. And I had this kind of moment of clarity. I'm like, look, man, you know, you're realizing your dream. You know, you actually have a song people know. You have two little kids on your lap. You have a great wife and family. You live in the freest country that's ever existed on this planet. It's like, you know, can you at least recognize that for a minute? And I'm like, well, you know, it's a common thought, but maybe there's a song here, you know, uh, maybe a wish is never better than this. You got a hundred years and the verses are stages of our lives. And so I kind of sat at the piano and came up with that little piano hook and, and kind of dug in, you know, Superman came very quickly. It came in like an hour, which was like a gift from God, but hundred years took two or three months. And, and, um, but again, I, I, you know, I love, I love playing hundred years because we're all in there somewhere, right? You know, I was, I was in the second verse when I wrote it. Now I'm in the bridge. Soon I'll be in the vamp, and then I'll have my last note and bye bye. <laughs> you know, but, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's still a lot of fun to play both those songs. That's really impressive. All right, mm -hmm. um, what's the best piece of advice you've ever received? Oh my God, um. You know, my dad is a very kind of amazing, simple man. He's the smartest man that, you know, the you know the best man. He's never had a drink. I've never heard him curse. You know, he's just old school, like, you know, really old school guy. And, you know, his philosophy is very simple. It's like, you know, treat people right. Um, you know, own up to it when you make a mistake. And you know, what really matters is your family. You know, um, we get obsessed with so many things. I, you know, I, I can't say I've been as good as I probably should have been about his life lessons, but my dad's been a great role model for me and just the way he lives his life and and what's important to him and um, and kind of his grace. Um, so I, I'd have to say that, that for me, uh, I was very lucky to be born, you know, to not just him, but my mom as well. Amazing. And, um, what inspires you daily? I'm sorry? What inspires you daily? Huh, what inspires me daily? <laughs> you know, it comes in the strangest places. You know, um, I don't know if it's daily, but, you know, when I uh, wrote the Afghanistan song, I started working with some of these NGOs evacuating Americans and allies. 
And I was so kind of kind of disgusted with our government. But then I'm meeting these Green Berets that are going undercover into these war zones, pulling people through sewers at night, getting them on airplanes, sleeping two hours a night, you know, losing 40 pounds, and then, you know, doing it again and again. And then they go to Ukraine and then they're in Israel. And it's like, so through through my kind of career, I've met heroes that people will never know their name. So you have people like that. And then just the other night, I spoke to 500 um, high school and college kids, many of them Jewish, not all of them, but you know, on the front lines fighting this anti-Semitism. You know, they're 16 years old, 17 years old, and they're under this kind of threat and bullies and 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 to see their fortitude and their clarity and their maturity, that gives me hope and that inspires me, you know. So um, you never know what's going to where it's going to come, but I've met some amazing people, you know, throughout my career, and as I said, many of those folks you'll probably you'll never know their name, but that's where I get my inspiration. Fascinating. Um, what well, what has been out of I guess you've had such an illustrious career, and you know obviously you've done so much. What are those specific fondest memories that just come to you when you look back and go, "Wow"? What are they? can you share some of those just key memories that just come to you like, "Wow, that was a pinch me moment." Man, there's been so many. I mean, certainly playing Madison Square Garden. Um, a couple of times, not by myself, but with radio shows or the concert for New York, you know, you, you play in these iconic venues, you know, you go around the world and you, you play in different countries, you know, playing in sports stadiums for me, I'm a huge sports guy. So playing at Dodger stadium for the outdoor Kings duck hockey game at home plate where I was going as a five-year-old to catch foul balls, you know, from Steve Garvey, you know, when I was seven years old and, and uh, the Daytona Hunt 500 and, you know, Monday Night Football, those are always special. And then, you know, going to Ukraine and sitting in a bombed out airport playing with Ukrainians and like, how is this a dream? <laughs> you know, so so I've just, you know, there's been so many things that are just like you pinch yourself and you're like, how is this real? Um, but, you know, that's kind of music, right? I mean, music creates miracles. And um, and uh, I've certainly been the benefit of a couple of them. What is your legacy you would like to leave? Oh my God. <laughs> um, to be the best hockey prognosticator on earth. No. <laughs> um, um, you know, I don't know. You know, everybody, you know, I, I hope, you know, I try to be a good dad, a good husband, a good son. Um, and I try to write things that, you know, maybe make people's lives um give them, you know, a little better than they might be without them. And, and lately, you know, maybe I, I don't look at myself as an activist at all. I kind of disdain that, but maybe, you know, shine the light on some people who really deserve it. And some, um, some people who are doing heroic work and stand up for, for our values. I mean, it, it sounds maybe dramatic, but, you know, freedom is kind of under attack and the world's on a tipping point. And a lot of artists, I think are on the wrong side, you know, and we're losing our kids. So hopefully, you know, some of these projects can, you know, shine the light on, on some really critical issues. Um, I don't expect everyone to agree with me, but I think songwriters have an obligation to talk about the world around them. And and so maybe, maybe some of that stuff will, you know, have a, have an effect. Right answer. What, well, not obviously getting too political here, but where do you see, generally speaking, the U.S. position going into the future? You know, it is so, in my mind, chaotic right now. You know, we're so tribal as a nation. Um, we are so locked into our, you know, our tribes. And, you know, the, the theme of my song is we're not okay. And I think we're not okay on our politics either. You know, we can't talk to each other. Um, whereas when I was growing up, you know, people had different opinions. and But we usually had the same goals. We just had different methods to get there. And we could shake hands and disagree and still be friends. And, and it's, that's the great thing about America. I think, you know, I think it's very dangerous time on the global stage. I, I think Afghanistan was, um, was much more severe cost than we thought, not just in, you know, lives and in the Afghan people. I just think the fact that we did that, we abandoned our allies and abandoned our own citizens 
you know, gave the evil actors on the world, I think, a thought of, okay, well, if there's a window to go, now's the time. And, you know, would have Putin invaded Ukraine? Maybe. Um, would have, you know, Hamas attacked Israel? Maybe. But I think, I think our foreign policy has been one of kind of soft, um, I don't want to say feckless, because I think, you know, we've been better on Ukraine. You know, I could call out the Republicans for Ukraine. So I'm, I'm not just picking on the Democrats. So I, I think it's a dangerous time for the country um, that we, we're not showing strength. And one day we support Israel, the next day we don't. Um, and I think that has a cost and we're seeing that. So I don't know what's going to happen in this election. I, I know whatever happens, there's going to be a lot of people very angry and unhappy. And I think all that does is give our enemies um, uh, more of a sense of um, aggression. And, and that's scary to me. So I hope we can tone it down a little bit and realize the big picture and, um, you know, and understand that, you know, America will survive this election. It's not the last election. Mm -hmm. Democracy will survive. We don't, you know, let, let's just like put our adult hats on and, and, and get through it. Um, but I, I gotta tell you, I, I'm, I'm very worried. And, and that's one reason I'm putting out these songs um, because, you know, very few artists, you know, have this worldview. So at least I have, have mine to share. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your insights too. It's really, um, really, really interesting. I really find that. Um, all Thank right. You. If you were 18 again and you could change anything, you could go back in time and change anything, what would you change? Or yeah, could you change? Well, you know, musically, what I would do is I'd, I'd collaborate a lot more. Uh, I've kind of been in my own little cave and um, in a sense that's worked, but I think I've probably missed some opportunities to collaborate with people more. And also my personal life. I think I've been so kind of focused on my career and music and promotion and doing everything you got to do. You know, I haven't developed as many friends as I think I like. I think it's very important, especially for men to have friends, you know, and to be able to discuss things and, you know, throw things off each other and, and hold each other up in, in times of, of tough times. I think I would focus on on that. Um, you know, the rest of my life has been pretty great. I made an amazing wife and great kids and and uh, still work at the family business. And, and you know, it, it kind of keeps me grounded. Um, but I think if those are the two things, I, I would collaborate more with fellow musicians and I would I would develop more friends outside of the business for myself. And um, but hey, look, I think if we all could go back to 18. We probably make a lot of changes. <laughs> Very true. Very true. Yeah. Um, John, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I do appreciate it. I've really enjoyed interviewing. I think, you know, it's incredible, obviously, the longevity you've had and even what you're doing now and going into the future. Sensation. Well, thank you, Nick. I appreciate it. I uh, look forward to our next chat. Definitely, mate. Keep in touch. All right, buddy. Thank you. Thank you.